My name is Michael Parkin. I teach the first year economics course at Western and uh, I'm going to talk to you today about something that is, I think, very much on all our minds. It's very hard to turn on a TV set or listen to a radio broadcast or open a newspaper or click on a website without seeing something about a global economic crisis. And uh, this crisis is presenting headwinds to Canada, hence the title of today's talk. I'm going to talk about Canada's place in the global economy, begin with that topic very briefly, and then describe the headwinds, and then talk about the policy dilemmas that the headwinds pose for both ourselves and people all around the world. And then I'm going to briefly at the end talk about the outlook. So let's begin with the place of Canada in the global economy. You can think of the global economy as a production machine for producing a very big pie. A pie that is actually valued at this year 80 trillion dollars. Uh, about a quarter of that, well about a fifth of that pie is, uh, is produced to the south of our border by the United States of America. Somewhat more than that, 20% exactly, is produced in the European Union. An even bigger slice is produced in a bunch of countries known by the acronym BRIC. Brazil, Russia, India, China. Big, big nations, huge populations, not rich but big. And then two other groups, a smallish group, 10% of other advanced industrial economies, and then a very big slice coming from other emerging economies, 26%. And there, the little white spot, that's us. <laughs> that's Canada. We produce about 2% of the world's production. Now, although we only produce 2% of the world's production, we're a very open economy. We, we sell to the rest of the world about 30% of what we produce and we buy from the rest of the world about a similar percentage of what we consume. So the rest of the world matters enormously to us. What's going on there affects what we can sell and affects what's available for us to buy. This pie is not only big at 80 trillion dollars, it grows. And in a normal year, it grows at about four, a bit more, four and a half percent. The growth is distributed like this. The big rich countries like the United States and the European Union grow at about 3% a year. BRIC grows at close to 10% a year, mainly driven by China. And I should have emphasized that China is 14% of that 23%. So that's it's mainly China. The other advanced economies grow at the same rate as, uh, as the US and Europe. The other emerging economies grow a bit faster, but not as fast as BRIC and then we grow at about the same as the average of the rich countries. So that's normal. That's what's going on in a normal year, a normal decade. Today we are living in a not totally normal situation. Growth has slowed. It slowed to about one and a half percent in the United States. It's stopped in Europe. They're not, mo not moving at all. Um, even in China and, and the other big uh, BRIC countries, it's slowed a little slowed a little in the other advanced countries, slowed in the other emerging economies, even in Canada it's slowed. We're still expanding, we're still growing. The Canadian economy is not in terrible shape, but it's not in the good shape that it would be in if we were in normal times. And we face headwinds from the fact that these economies have slowed and this one, this big European bloc, has stopped altogether. So what are the headwinds? First, from that previous picture, slower growth in the global economy. The slowdown in growth of the global economy is throwing at us a problem for growth of our own exports and prob other problems. It's not throwing at us a major financial problem. We don't have shaky banks. We don't have banks that are beholden to, to debt that might go bad. But we do have the problem that we produce stuff that we want to sell to the rest of the world. And, uh, it's just very hard to do that when the world is in such a slow growth environment. So why is the growth, why is growth in the global economy so slow? The main answer is because there is enormous uncertainty and the uncertainty is making business investment very poor. Business entrepreneurs who've got ideas are reluctant to chance them in a world that is so uncertain. They are reluctant to Re replace 
existing plant that needs replacing because it's reaching the end of its useful life. So business investment is very, very low. When you listen to the pundits on the radio and television, they talk about the consumer as the problem. Consumption is two-thirds of production, but the consumer isn't the problem. We are still consuming two-thirds of production. The problem is investment in business. Business investment has dried up almost, and that is where the slower growth in the global economy is coming from. Now, why has business investment slowed? What's the source of the uncertainty that's brought about this? It's unsustainable government budgets. Many governments around the world are spending more than they're raising in revenues, and on a scale such that their debt to income ratio is not only rising, it's rising unsustainably, and it has no visible steady state. It's just going up and up and up and up and up. To understand that, let's begin with some facts. Everybody these days talks about Greece, and for good reason. That is the ratio of government debt to income in Greece since uh, 1980. And you see how in the last few years it has just taken off like a rocket. Greece is not alone. The other, an, another country that you hear a great deal about is Portugal. Portugal's a good way behind Greece, but we don't have the data all the way back on that country, but it's climbing too. And another country we hear all about is Italy. Italy is a very surprising situation because it has a high debt-to-income ratio, but it's always had a high debt-to-income ratio. Italy has been chugging along at 100%. Uh, since um, almost since Silvio Berlusconi was a boy. It's, um, it's uh, a, very, uh, a very long and, and, and sustained story. Another, another country that's in the, in the news is Ireland. Uh, in fact, Portugal, Ireland, uh, Greece and Spain are known as, as the pigs. Um, and the Ireland notice was doing really very well until the global financial crisis hit in 2007. Ireland then bailed out some banks and joined the rest of the, 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 the troubled countries with a very big debt-to-income ratio. Spain, that is a lot in the news, is not in such bad shape. It's um, a bit of a mystery to me as to why Spain is, uh, is, is joining the others, because its debt-to-income ratio is rather, rather, rather tame. It's a lot like that of the United Kingdom, and a lot like that of Canada. We're down there, pretty, pretty safe. There's another country, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about it in a moment, that is not in good shape, and it's not in Europe. It's just right next door to us, the United States of America. It has a debt-to-income ratio that is climbing. It's not as high yet as these Europeans, but it's climbing. And there's more to be said about that, because when we project these growth rates forward, when we project these debt, debt levels forward using the International Monetary Fund's currently uh, published estimates, we see that everyone except Spain and the United States are going to <coughs> have a declining debt-to-income ratio through to 2016. That's Greece, um, and then uh, in order, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Ireland, Spain goes up, the United Kingdom comes down, Canada comes down, and the United States of America climbs, keeps climbing, keeps climbing. Some mathematics for you, the simple math. Math of debts and deficits. The debt next year is equal to the debt this year, plus the interest that you've got to pay on the debt this year, plus what we call the basic deficit. The deficit this year, not counting the debt interest. The, the, the number that you see published is the sum of these two. That's, that's the total government deficit, but break it up in that fashion. Now, what we worry about is not the absolute level, the dollar magnitudes, but the ratio to gross domestic product. The overall level of production in the economy. So we're interested in the debt to GDP ratio. That ratio is linked next year to what it is this year. And what does the linking? Well, we not go through the steps of the algebra, but what links it is a number that you hope is not going to be as big as one. You hope it's going to be smaller than one, because you don't want to have a situation in which, if you've got no deficit, the debt to income ratio keeps rising. And that would be the case if this number is bigger than one. What is this number? One plus the interest rate on debt, expressed just as a proportion, not as a percentage. 
and then 1 plus the growth rate of gross domestic product expressed as a proportion. 1 plus the interest rate over 1 plus the growth rate. If the growth rate's bigger than the interest rate and you don't have a deficit, your debt to income ratio will shrink. If that ratio is bigger than 1 and you don't have a deficit, your debt to income ratio will rise. Add to that the basic deficit to GDP ratio this year and you've got the equation that tells you how the debt to GDP ratio evolves. It evolves according to this equation. This year's deficit added to this year's debt or mul multiplied by this number tells you what you're going to be at next year. Now, some numbers. Greece, the big basket case. Greece's 1 plus R over 1 plus G is 1.2 way, way too big. Their interest rate is high, it's in the teens and low, low 20s some, some days, and their growth rate is virtually zero. Their debt to GDP ratio, 153% this year, a 10% deficit this year, they're going to hit 200% almost next year. Italy is not, not as bad by any means. Italy's got a very small basic deficit, its debt to GDP ratio is just, on a, just shy of 100, and its numbers are growing like this. The United States of America is in slightly better shape in terms of this number. It's got low interest rates relative to its growth rate. That's because the Federal Reserve is keeping interest rates really, really low. But it has a big deficit, an 8% deficit, a $1.5 trillion deficit uh, that, uh, that is 8% of US GDP. And so US debt to GDP ratio is rising. And we hear a lot about the general problems of Europe, but Europe as a whole, this is the European Union in aggregate, 4%, half of America's deficit, 66%, not as big as America, 9.98, not as big a problem. Uh, and that this is based on, not on the zero growth rate, but on, on the growth rate for the last year. And then it's coming in at 69%. So Europe is, um, is not in such bad shape as even as America overall, which you don't get that, you don't get that sense from the, the reporting in the press. You get the sense that America is, is just doing fine and Obama can go to Europe and tell them how to behave and the world will be good. But that's just, just not the case. So what are the policy dilemmas? I'm going to look at the regions. The main policy dilemma for Europe is figuring how, out how to make a monetary union work when there are 17 individual fiscal authorities, 17 indiv individual countries. Um, in, in Canada we have provinces that have independent budgets, uh, but we have a federal government that has a budget too. And our monetary system, we have a single monetary system for the provinces of Canada, but because we have a federal government too, issuing federal debt, we can operate a federal monetary policy. Europe is trying to operate a monetary policy for the whole of the Eurozone out of the e European Central Bank in Frankfurt, but there is no European fiscal authority, which means there's no European government issuing European government bonds in, in which the European Central Bank can deal when it, when it operates to, to create liquidity uh, in, in Europe. So, if the European Central Bank was to do what the Federal Reserve did, the Federal Reserve created an enormous amount of liquidity, almost $3 trillion worth of it, by buying US government bonds. If the ECB was to do something like that, called quantitative easing, it would have to buy the bonds of the individual countries. And the countries that have got most bonds for sale are the ones whose bonds you really wouldn't like the ECB to be buying. They're the Italian bonds and Greek bonds and so on. Uh, so there's a real dilemma to getting that system to work. There was a treaty called the Maastricht Treaty, which committed countries who joined the euro system to maintaining budget balances of not, deficits not greater than 3% of GDP and debt to GDP ratios of some magnitude according to the different countries' situations, but much lower than what they have moved into in the last two or three years. So Europe has that massive problem. Recently, it's tackling, I mean, it's tackling this problem, uh, and recently there have been some very interesting personnel changes uh, in, in Europe. Personnel change in, in, uh, in, uh, in Rome, in Athens, and, uh, and, in, and in Frankfurt at the ECB. 
And all, in all, every case, an economist has been moved into the decision-making position. The economist in, uh, in Athens is uh, a gentleman called Lucas um, Tapadimos uh, in Rome, Mon Mario Monti, and in, uh, in Frankfurt at the ECB, an Itali another Italian, Mario Drachi. Interesting fact about these three economists, they're all trained in the USA, and they're all trained at MIT or Yale. Monty Yale, the other two at MIT. And the interesting thing about MIT and Yale in the 1970s and 80s when these guys were graduate students is that they were hotbeds of Keynesian macroeconomics. Keynesian macroeconomics is code word for expansionist, interventionist, fiscalist, print money, throw, throw, throw tax cuts and spending increases at the economy and all will be well. One would predict that if these guys get their way, they will be expansionist. Mario Draghi will find a way of buying bonds and printing money and creating liquidity in Europe. Uh, Mario Monti will be a fiscally responsible guy in Italy, but he will be not too keen on too much short-term austerity. So I think you can expect to see some, some Keynesian attitudes and ideas prevailing in Europe as they, as they wrestle with this, this problem of how to cope with uh, the, the debt situation and the deficit situation. For the United States, um, the, the challenge is, uh, is different but massive. Just want to stay on time here. The United States, first of all, does not have the kind of fiscal base that the, um, that the Europeans have. The Europeans have a value-added tax system to accompany their income tax system, and they routinely collect 49, 50, 51, 52% of gross domestic product in taxes. In the United States of America, as you know, there is no value-added tax. There is no goods and services tax. There's no harmonized sales tax. They don't have that. They don't have that tax that we have and that the Europeans have. It's very difficult to see the Americans raising much more than they're currently raising in taxes. Sure, they can tax the 1%, but taxing the 1% isn't going to do very much. The 1% between them, don't, they don't make that much. Uh, and uh, when you multiply that by a tax rate, uh, and when you take account of all the deductions that, that they'll still be in place, it's not going to do much. So the Americans have got a serious problem. They've got an even more serious problem, though, than the numbers suggest. A few years ago, two economists called Gokhale and Smetters, who worked in, at the Treasury at the time but have since left, did a study to figure out what is the net present value of the commitments of the United States government under Social Security Medicare and Medicaid, based on known demographics, what is that liability? And how does the, that liability, minus the tax projections that you can get from existing tax laws, how does, what does that number add up to? What is, in other words, the net present value of the commitments of the United States government? The US's true debt to income ratio is 600%, not the 60 or 70% that you see in the regular numbers. Now, what, could you, what, what, could, what can the Americans do about that? Yeah. Well, said, said Gokhale and Smedders, they can do a, a few things. If they were to raise income taxes, all income taxes, by 70%, they would just about get there. If they were to raise all Social Security taxes by 95%, they would get there. If they were to cut all Social Security benefits by 60%, they would get there. If they were to cut all so-called discretionary expenditures, including the entire national defense budget, they would get there. But any one of those, thi any, any one of those things is clearly impossible. Some linear combination of the four, of course, is also possible, but devastating. So you can see that long term, the United States has a very serious problem, a problem that is not going to be addressed by the super committee that is currently trying to figure out how to save a trillion or two dollars. It's not going to be solved by the political system that the Americans have. The residual is going to solve it. The residual is the printing press.
that's the only way governments can make things work when the regular fiscal system doesn't work is to print the money. And that's, history shows that that's, that's the way it happens. The, the person who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economic Science this year, one of the two people, is named Tom Sargent. Tom wrote a paper way back in the 1970s called Unpleasant Monetarist Arithmetic, in which he showed that it's the debt and the deficit that drive the inflation rate in the long term. And that, that because money, money printing is driven itself by the debt and deficit situation. So the, the US situation is, I believe, very serious. The problem for the other big player, China, uh, the uh, policy dilemma there is what to do about its currency. China has adopted a, a managed floating exchange rate system. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it, um, it manages the value of the currency, which in turn manages its internal price level in a manner that is a, a valid way of, of organizing uh, monetary policy. They've got to decide whether they're going to stick with that, or whether they're going to move to something that is more like our f more freely floating exchange rate. And that's, that's their big dilemma. They don't have any, any other real problems. They, some people say they're overheating, that China is going to inflate and, and, get, and, and reach barriers to growth. But there is so much slack in the agricultural labor force in that economy that another decade or two of growth at 10% will not take it up. There's plenty of, res of, of resources in China uh, available. Don't worry about us. What's our policy dilemma? Well, our major policy dilemma is figuring out how to keep the Canadian economy expanding in the face of all this stuff that's going on in the rest of the world and to maintain a good degree of monetary and financial independence from the United States. Both very difficult. It's very hard to stay, stay fit and healthy if you're in a room full of people who are coughing and spluttering and they've all got flu. You're likely going to get it. Um, but we've got, we've got to design our system so that we do the best we can. And we, we have two things in place that are very good. One, we have something called the inflation control targeting monetary policy. We set an inflation target of 2% and the Bank of Canada's job is to keep it there. And it's done so very, very well since 1993. So there's almost 20 years of success. We just renewed that commitment just last week. And if the bank can keep doing what it's been doing, uh, we will maintain Canadian inflation at a reasonable level. But we will have to be willing to see the Canadian dollar appreciate substantially against the US dollar if my fears about the Americans turns out to be correct. If the Americans do have significant inflation, we would have to be willing to see our dollar rise and rise and rise and rise and rise uh, to, to stop it from coming here. The second thing we've got that, that is very healthy is a, ver is a low debt to GDP ratio. We have, a, we have a very manageable and low debt to GDP ratio that is not a problem. We have a deficit at the moment, but it's not a major structural deficit. Most of it will, will go away when the economy returns to full employment. If that, if that does indeed happen uh, in the, the middle years of, of the decade. So the outlook, very briefly, and uh, I think we have a little bit of time. Uh, Near-term output outlook, 2012-2013, we're going to see a world that is growing slowly and a Canadian economy that's growing slowly. We're not going to be having gangbuster economic activity for the next two years. The, if, if the policy situation remains as it now is, and I think it will, uh, pretty much remains as it now is, that uh, medium term uh, outlook, that's say uh, 2014 to about 2019, that too could be, could be unspectacular. We could have a sort of uh, the kind of lost <coughs> decade that Japan had in the 1990s, a decade in which we don't stagnate, but we don't grow at the, at the traditional rate as rapidly as we normally do. And that most likely would be associated with poor job prospects, especially for younger people, and especially for older people who are not yet ready to retire, but who get, 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 get dropped from a job and then find it very difficult to find a new job. So poor labor market conditions could, could prevail. Longer term, um, I, I fear inflation. And I fear inflation because I don't see a good sign that, mon that, 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 that fiscal authorities, that governments, know what they're doing and are able to bring their budgets into balance, bring their, bring their, their tax revenues into line with their expenditures. And uh, the, um, the demographic uh, trend 
uh, does not help that. So long term, I'm somewhat pessimistic. And I think that is all I have to say, except to thank you very much and to invite questions if you have any.